I became, as I involved myself in this work, uh, I, became, I actually got one of my most uh, cited things was a, a study I did on the game of cricket, interestingly. And so I wrote a, a game, uh, a, a text about the game of cricket called Today's Cricket. And what a game of cricket, I'm talking about, a, 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 you know, a game with a bat that they play in, in particularly in the British Empire Commonwealth countries. But I, I wrote the text based upon a typical newspaper article, and I sort of said something like, the bowler plays their men in slips and covers, but to no avail. The batsman hit one four after another, as well as an occasional six. Not once did their ball hit the stumps or get caught. I use this to show a simple-minded sort of thing, a couple of things actually, that I could, uh, for folks who didn't have much background in the game of cricket, they could probably perform like a student does in school. So what did the batsman hit? Oh, one four after another. And uh, so it looks like they're comprehending pretty well, but are they really? Do they, they really have a, a sort of a, a sense of the meaning? The bowlers place their men in slips and covers. So I ask another question, where do the bowlers place their men? Oh, perfect comprehension, but to no avail. And it's only that when I begin to actually open myself up to sort of saying, well, what's happening in this game? And opening up myself to a, a broader view of comprehension that I can really assess whether somebody is understanding this. That again, the power of one's background knowledge the, and, you know, what do I need to tell them in terms of, do, do I need them to bring their knowledge of baseball to the game, that the batsman is like uh, uh, the batsman in, bowl, in, in, uh, in baseball, and what's it for is, I can explain that to them, and the bowler is like, like, like the pitcher. Indeed, to improve comprehension, it's to do with background knowledge, rather than rewriting the text so it's simpler, and rather than asking the kids uh, a bunch of, uh, of questions. And while this, um, these simple passages um, just seem sort of uh, uh, pretty obvious, they, they reinforce a, a, the, the real key thing that the best predictor of a person's reading comprehension is indeed their background knowledge, but more than that, they're accessing their background knowledge um, and using it uh, for purposes of understanding a text. And so that the raw material of meaning making has to do with a, with a child's uh, use of their experiences to participate in the text, pulling together what they know in a, in a constructive sort of fashion. Unfortunately, if, as, as we began to sort of argue these things, we were dealing with teachers who were mostly accustomed to asking kids questions. Indeed, if you, if you look at the studies of, of uh, observations of teachers, they, they're not really engaging kids in this sort of reading and thinking, uh, comprehending background knowledge building type of thing. They're mostly asking kids questions about, uh, about the text. And if you look at the curriculums developed, they're sort of guided by this orientation to testing kids by giving them a passage and a bunch of questions, rather than beginning to look at uh, other dimensions of their reading by other means. Now, from a researcher perspective, um, if you think about it, this research interest also shifts what we're going to do as a researcher. Or if I'm going to study reading comprehension, yeah, sure, I could ask a few questions like the questions I've asked, and that might give me some information. But if I want to align it with the types of things that I'm interested in relative to the activation of background knowledge, I'm going to approach their uh, reading comprehension differently. I might ask them to give me a retelling, which isn't biased by them thinking about what I'm looking for. I might sort of, in a sense, be 
very much like what a lawyer probably does in a, in a, in a courtroom. Be careful not to actually influence a person's testimony. And in a classroom, giving students, or in a research study, giving students an opportunity to do retellings. I might also use the finding that we quickly discovered that oftentimes uh, the child who might not feel that confident is fairly hesitant even to give you a retelling. So you might have to probe them using sort of almost therapeutic techniques where you do sorts of reflective listening. Can you tell me more and things like that? But there's also another thing which sort of breaks through the glass ceiling of the psychological practices that dominated. You, psychological practices that dominated were primarily interested in what was observable. When indeed what we're after here is we really want to tap into what students are thinking, which means we've got to come up with procedures which encourage them to share with us in different ways in ways that don't distort the, the activity too much, what's going on in their head, what they're, uh, what they're thinking as they're reading. Again, if you align yourself with a progressive refinement model, you've got to be open to the fact that you can't measure their understanding based upon a total reading of the text if, in fact, they've only read the first couple of sentences. So you're looking for ways to actually Oh, uh, talk to the kids in either uh, a retrospective sort of fashion or a think aloud type of fashion, which enables you to look at these things. And if you are interested in some of the things that I'm interested in, you're probably also interested in their perspective. In other words, where's in this text of Alan, uh, Alan Collins' text, how are they positioning themselves? Are they positioning themselves way at a distance, just watching this thing as a, as a person might in a crowd? Or are they identifying with the male or the female? And how are they actually moving around with their perspectives in, the, in this world of the text? And, and it's only in, by beginning to sort of probe into those things that you might really get a, a full understanding of that pers person's meaning-making experience. And then you also ask yourself another tough question, for which I don't really have a good answer at this point in time, but I suspect I'll spend a lot of my time still struggling to find out uh, means of doing this, is all, I'm, all I've focused on so far is what I would call verbocentric aspects of this. Um, and by verbocentric, I really haven't sort of delved into the images. Uh, what are they really seeing in their mind's eye? And I'm focused uh, on what they give me verbally in the form of words. And are there ways of actually dealing with studying their meaning that sort of gets into the images? And what are the natures of those images? And are they moving around in these sort of worlds, like some kind of what some people refer to as a homunculus, a sort of a, a little me that sort of travels around in this world, world of the text. And do these people have control of this? Are they like a film director who sort of says, oh, okay, I think I should read this text from a different perspective. I maybe try this, this angle. And so you can start to sort of see that this started to break through that glass ceiling and behaviorism to sort of ask, I think, some really interesting sorts of questions. And in particular, uh, break out of so many boxes, uh, to the box of introspection, the box of ongoing meaning making, the box which is less, uh, less verbocentric, and yet another box, which is, uh, which is I'll, I'll be talking about more extensively next lecture. The box that I'm in here is I'm inside the head of the reader. I'm inside the head. What if meaning making isn't something that one just does by oneself, but in the context of others? And indeed, in today's world with text messaging and Twitter and that, you know exactly what I mean. You're part of an intertextual connect connection. Your world is, is not just inside your head, 
it has connections to, and the context is not fixed, which we were treating it as, as this way. The social isn't like a fixed variable. The social is a dynamic variable that needs also to come into play in, in this fashion. It, it's interesting the, the extent to which this cognitive turn required opening ourselves up to these different lenses so we could get outside ourselves in a sense to look back at ourselves and realize the limitations of our past analyses, but also the possibilities that this opened up. It's not trivial to sort of say to a teacher, hey, you know, instead of always going from the literal to the inferential to the interpretive, that, you know, I, I actually think that that's not necessarily the, the way to meaning making that is occurring or should be occurring in your, in your classroom. Instead of uh, advocating a to a teacher that they just improve the quality of their questions, to begin to actually be, to provide them frameworks and understandings of meaning making uh, that be begin to help them uh, have, in a sense, of uh, a theory which begins to sort of guide them in much more sensible ways to to uh, engage with their readers. There's yet another key thing that I haven't talked about here. Uh, but if, in fact, the best predictor of reading comprehension is background knowledge, it raises an interesting question. I think for a long time, people thought that reading comprehension was directly related to one's inherent intelligence. What I'm suggesting here is I can make a person who might be considered to be a very good reader look like a poor reader if, in fact, I can manipulate text based upon their background of experience. Think about the ramifications for that for dealing with people across cultures and how we, to ex what extent we're actually creating a, a curriculum that has the breadth of a reading material that enables people to sort of see themselves and experiencing their, their worlds or bring their world uh, to the text. It also, this sort of breaking out of this sort of model that intelligence is a predictive reading comprehension to background knowledge is and how you activate it. It also raises even a, a much more interesting question, which we'll, we'll talk about next time. Can we actually increase intelligence? Can we actually use what we know about meaning making to, to help people become more effective meaning makers? You know, in our surveys, at, at, particularly at this time, of what we were doing with high school teachers, high, high school students, we were finding a fairly sad approach to reading. It was they would read something once, oftentimes as quickly as possible. They'd oftentimes lament that they weren't a fast reader. They wouldn't stop and pause and reflect upon the, 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 the world. So they'd read it once, they'd try to read it as quickly as possible, and guess what they were frustrated by? The inability to remember things. Well, you know, when you think about and this is the interesting question is, okay, so based upon this, what might we do to help a, a, a reader comprehend better? We wouldn't be encouraging them to continue behaviors based upon that. At this point in time, you know, people would sort of say, oh, you know, how important it is to read things quickly. And I would sort of say, woo -hoo. If you really want to encourage somebody to read, I, I think there are a whole bunch of other things we could ask them to do, which would actually add to um, reading comprehension, uh, abilities that were, that were likely to be sustainable and recall and use of that information in much more meaningful ways uh, by beginning to use what we know about what people do as we make meaning. Well, that will be, to a large extent, the topic of the next lecture. How do we learn how to learn? Or what uh, John Flavel, a famous developmental psychologist, talked about. Is there a, a thing called metacognition? Uh, a cognition about cognition that we could actually apply uh, to learning how to learn? 
Or as Vygotsky, the famous Russian psychologist, sort of said, well, what about the social? Or Piaget even pointed out, and Donaldson as well. You know, what, what are those dynamics that also can come into play uh, and that should be part of our model of meaning making, but also part of our model of helping people make meaning better? That will be the focus of what we talk about next time. Thanks very much.